Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're going to have, he, we're, um, we're hearing his talk today, which is mostly joint with Yuval, and it's on the limiting shape of internal DNA with multiple sources. So this mostly is at Yuval's insistence. He likes to be modest. <laughs> so okay, so I'm going to talk about internal DLA with multiple sources. So let me tell you what that is. We have a finite set of points in the integer lattice ZD, and we're going to start some number m of particles at each of these points. And each particle will perform a simple random walk um, until it reaches an unoccupied site. So unoccupied meaning there are no other particles at that site. And what you get from this is some random set of k times m points in the lattice. And basic uh, property of this model, internal DLA, is that you can perform these k times m walks in any order, and the re resulting random set you get, um, its distribution won't depend on the order you perform the walks. So this was first noticed uh, by Diaconis and Fulton, 91. So, yes, so y you have a lot of freedom, so you can you can do the following. So at each time step, you point to a site which has more than one particle, and you ask one particle there to take one random walk step. And no matter which sites you point to in what order, at the end when you stop, if every site has at most one particle, the distribution won't well, do. Yes. And, and you can even choose which of the sites, depending on, depending on the path, sure. So here's a simulation of this. So I've s chosen 100 point sources, and they're spaced out on a sublattice of Z2. So there's the spacing is is uh, 50 lattice units. So so this first source is at the origin, say, this source is at 50 comma 0, 100 comma 0, 0 comma 50, and so on. And each, each source started with 2,500 particles, and we got this set. Here's another picture. This time I've started with, uh, with random sources, so I took a big box think a 500 by 500 box in Z2. And I picked 100 random points in that box. And at each of those 100 sources, I started 3,000 particles. And I get this funny looking shape. So these are the types of shapes we're interested in studying. In particular, the questions we're going to ask are, uh, what happens if you fix some points now, instead of in the lattice, fix points in RD? And then we'll run internal DLA on finer and finer lattices um, with source points chosen at lattice points close to my points in RD. And the question is, uh, is there a scaling limit? So, do, so you see there's this kind of fuzz on the boundary, which comes from the <coughs> effects of the finite lattice size. So can we control that fuzz and show it goes away in the limit? OK, so here's these two pictures, or related pictures. So 
So first let me just say what's known, or what was known before our work about the scaling limit, and that's essentially the case of a single point source, so k equals 1. You start all your particles at, say, a single source, you may as well assume it's the origin in Zd, and you let them perform simple random walks till they reach an unoccupied site. And this is a result of Lawler, Branson, and Griffith that the scaling limit is a ball. Now, a ball is one thing because it's uh, maybe not so hard to guess it's a ball. Now, of course, it's still a little bit surprising because it, you're working on a square lattice, so you wouldn't assume immediately that you get a ball. But you know, once you guess it's a ball, then at least you know what the limit is you're trying to prove. For multiple sources, we have this additional difficulty that a priori we don't really know what to expect the limiting shape to be. So one approach you might take to this, since we're looking for a scaling limit in RD, let's maybe try to just define directly some dynamics in RD. So while well, we're running random walks in the lattice, so we should run Brownian motions in RD. But this sort of naive approach doesn't get you very far because, sure, you can take some region in RD and start a Brownian motion and run it until it exits the region, but then it's not so clear, you know, how much mass should I add on to the region at that point? You know, what should I add a little ball there? You know, does, does, it, does the dynamics depend on those choices? So that's uh, one difficulty which I'll, I hope I can convey today is how we get around this issue of not even knowing a priori what the scaling limit is. So let me state a sort of preliminary Okay, so you can grow the balls, I agree with that, but then, and this is actually the, the approach we take, but then when the balls start to overlap, how do you push the mass out to the outside? That's the difficulty. But you'll see this is, this is the, the idea we use. So, okay, let me state a preliminary version of, of our first main result. So, we fix some finite set of points in RD, and I'm going to generalize things slightly. So rather than take the same number of particles at each site, I'll associate an intensity to each site. So lambda i is the intensity of mass starting at that site. Okay, and now in the lattice, so it's, I rescale the lattice, so I have 1 over n zd, and I start with this proportional to n to the d particles at each site xi. Now xi is a site in RD, so we need to start with a lattice site. Um, so I'm going to use this notation xi with these superscript <coughs> four points to just mean the closest lattice, closest lattice point to xi. Okay, and we get some random set of occupied sites in the lattice. Okay, and the theorem is, as the lattice gets finer, there's a deterministic domain in RD such that these sets i sub n are converging to d. Now, I have to explain, you know, what, what does this convergence mean? These are random sets. Even if they weren't random, what does it mean for a sequence of domains to converge to a domain? So this is the sense of convergence we'll use. And it might look a little technical, but it essentially amounts to convergence in the Hausdorff metric. So specifically, we say that i n converges to d, if for any epsilon, you can, for sufficiently large n, squeeze this domain i n in between an inner and outer epsilon neighborhood of the domain d. Now, the reason I say this is just a preliminary version of the theorem is it's not very specific, so it doesn't say anything about what this domain actually is. And so we actually have a lot of uh, information about you know what this domain actually is, and I'll I'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, questions so far? Yes, it's just a set, bounded set in RD. Other questions? All 
Okay, so this is uh, a sort of initial reduction of the problem, and it's exactly what Christian just suggested. So the idea is, well, first let's have the sources just ignore each other and form independent IDLA clusters. So around each source, you get a cluster. And we know from the Lawler, Branson, and Griffith result that those clusters are close to balls. But they have overlaps. And so the difficulty is um, we need to take the particles in the overlap and let them continue walking until they reach unoccupied sites. And that will change the shape. And the question is how. So this is just an il illustration of this idea with two point sources. So first I'm growing this blue cluster around a source that was right here. And now I'm growing a green cluster around a source that's there. And now I'm forcing the overlaps to find unoccupied sites. <laughs> this is dangerous. I can't turn this off. So now this motivates the following idea, which is uh, goes back to Diaconus and Fulton. There's nothing special in this construction. You know, in our application, we happen to find it convenient to take these blue and green sets to be internal DLA clusters. But you could do the same operation with any two overlapping sets in ZD. And that's called the diaconus fulton sum of the two sets. So this is an operation which, given two sets in ZD, will produce some random set whose cardinality is the sum of the cardinalities of A and B. And the construction of this diaconus fulton sum is the following. So you take the intersection of A and B and order its points, say y1 through yk. And then we'll build up the set a plus b one side at a time. So we start with the union, so call that c0. And then we'll form, so cj is going to be cj minus 1, union a single point. And the single point is what we get when we start a simple random walk at yj and run the walk until it exits cj minus 1, and then add that point to Cj minus 1. Right. So, so the reason this is a, an interesting thing to consider is that although this construction seems to depend on this ordering y1 through yk of the points in the intersection, in fact, because of this abelian property, you can reorder them, and you'll get a set with the same distribution. So here's the diaconus fulton sum of two squares in Z2, which overlap in this smaller square. So the red points are the points outside the union of the two squares, which got added. OK, are there any questions about the, the definition clear for a diaconus Fulton sum? Okay. So. So now I want to describe the story of uh, how we actually identify the limiting shape. And the key is to first remove the randomness from the picture. And we could, we'll put it back in at the end. So to remove the randomness, we're going to consider a deterministic model where instead of having discrete particles that are doing random walks, each site in the lattice will have some continuous amount of mass. So what we'll do is we have our two sets in ZD, and we'll start with each site in the intersection of A and B having mass 2, and each site in the symmetric difference having mass 1. 
and the mass will move around according to the following rule. So at each time step, you choose a lattice site which has mass greater than 1, and you have it distribute its excess mass over 1 equally to its neighbors. Now, as time goes to infinity, what you'll get is a limiting region of lattice sites, uh, all of which have mass 1, and then a boundary strip of width 1, where the sites can have some fractional mass between 0 and 1. So I'll call this uh, region A plus B with a circle around the plus. So this is some kind of... Yes, so there's... It's not a very hard result, but there's something to be proved here about this. So you need a weak you need some weak conditions that you'll given a site which has mass one you'll eventually choose that site. So you with the condition that's sort of the weakest thing you could require to hope. Because once a site gets mass 1, it's, it never goes below 1. So you only distribute the excess m, m of x minus 1 equally to the neighbor. That's right. Yes. So, so now how do I build that up from 1 over 2 to 1? Okay, there are some sites which have fractional mass, but they are only on the boundary of this A plus B. So the point... Okay, but that's easy to see because if you can't receive any mass unless one of your neighbors gave it to you, and that neighbor has to already have mass 1. Okay. Yes, good question. So there is an abelian property for this model. <laughs> um, can you predict the next slide too? <laughs> I think you're right. Let's see. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so here's a comparison of the two uh, the two operations. And you can see this divisible sand file sum is some kind of smoothed out um, version of the random diaconus Fulton sum. Okay, now how are we going to understand you know, what shape this is? So what we do is in addition to looking at the shape, we look at a function on that shape, which we call the odometer function, and this is just it counts for every lattice site the total amount of mass that that site emitted. And this function um, has a very nice property, so it's discrete Laplacian. So discrete Laplacian of a function at a site x is the average value at the neighbors of x minus the value at x. Now what is that for this particular function? Well, for each neighbor y of x, Whenever y distributes any mass, it distributes it equally among its neighbors. So this u of y over 2d is just the total amount of mass y sends to x. So this sum is just the total amount of mass that x receives. And u of x, by definition, is the total amount that x emits. So when we take the difference, we just get the ending mass minus the starting mass, and that's this difference of indicators. So it ended with mass 1 if x is in a plus b, and it started with mass 1a plus 1b. Okay, that's nice. Now we also have a boundary condition saying just that u vanishes uh, on the boundary of a plus b because outside a plus b, no mass is moving. Now, at first glance, it doesn't seem like we made any progress here because what we're after is not the function but actually the domain a plus b. But on the other hand, this system is telling us, well, we have 
Laplacian of u equals something inside the domain. We have a boundary condition. You can solve that system in any domain. So, so clearly we need some additional information to specify what this domain is actually going to be. So can anyone see any additional information we have about this function u? It's not constant inside. So it's so U of X is the total amount of mass emitted from X. It's conservation of the mass, but u is the amount that emits. What's the most basic thing we know about total amount of <laughs> mass emitted from x? But it's, it's less than one or two of the Well, mass could move around a lot. So even if you started with only a little bit, it could move and be emitted from the same site many times. Not integer valued because it's this is the divisible sand pile, so the mass okay i thought I thought this would be easy, but it's just that u is non negative so <laughs> the key is if you solve this if you solve this in uh some domain, then you'll get a solution, but the solution might be negative somewhere so that's some pretty strong condition saying our domain has to be have the property that the unique solution to this system is non-negative. Now it turns out that's not quite enough to uniquely specify the domain, but it's more or less it's almost enough. So so here's a formulation which uniquely specifies the domain. So in PDE, this is what's known as a free boundary problem. So typ typically in PDE, you know, you're given your domain in advance, and you have some unknown function on the domain. So the free boundary problem is when you have an unknown function defined in an unknown domain, and you want to specify both the domain and the function. Okay. So the conditions are, well, our domain is the support of the function. The function is non-negative. We have this Laplacian condition. And notice I've now changed the equality to an inequality, and the reason is this so this equality holds in this a plus b but actually it holds with inequality everywhere because this this one is the total is the final amount of mass so that's one inside a plus b but it's less than or equal to one everywhere okay and this last condition says just that in these two inequalities at least one must be an equality so Either u is 0 and we're outside our domain, or this Laplacian has to be actually equal to the difference of indicators. So this first formulation is the one we actually use. I just briefly mentioned an alternative formulation, which in some ways is more intuitive, which just adds this condition so we've seen these two conditions already. So what's added here is the gradient of u also vanishes on the boundary of the domain. So intuitively, the way to think about this gradient condition is it's saying that no mass is escaping the domain. Because by, so by Green's theorem, if you integrate the Laplacian of u over the domain, that's that's keeping track of how much mass is escaping the domain. By Green's theorem, that's the same as integrating the normal derivative against the boundary. But because u is non-negative, all the normal derivative contributions have the same sign. So in order for no mass to escape, you actually have to have the gradient vanishing. OK. And now we've almost, so there's one more kind of reformulation. And then we'll be able to identify our scaling limit. And in a sense, I think this is the hardest version of the problem to internalize on this slide. 
it's the most unintuitive seeming, but its advantage is we can really, at the end of this slide, just change all the sums to integrals, and everything will work in RD. And so that's how we'll uh, see what the scaling limit is. So in PDE, it's called the problem of the least superharmonic majorant. So we start out with this function gamma, which is in PDE called the obstacle. And basically, we're constructing this gamma to have a certain Laplacian. So gamma is going to be this quadratic term uh, minus the sum of some Green's functions. So G is the Green's function for simple random walk in ZD. So I'll give some geometric intuition in a second. So this is called the obstacle problem. And you'll s hopefully see why in a little bit. So, so you take the Green's function for simple random walk. In Z2, you have to use the recurrent potential kernel instead. And you form this function gamma. And then you consider the least superharmonic major. And so among all superharmonic functions on the lattice, which are greater than or equal to gamma, you take their pointwise and femum. And the punchline is that the odometer function is just the difference between these two. Now this seems like, wow, you know, where did this come from? But so it took us a long time to find this approach. It's not very intuitive. But I want to show the proof of this claim because uh, you know, once you formulate things this way, it's actually very easy to see why. It just fits on one slide. So Let's let m of x be the amount of mass that's present at x in the final state. So we've seen that the odometer has this Laplacian, and m is less than or equal to 1. Now, this obstacle gamma was constructed to have Laplacian 1a plus 1b minus 1. Okay. It means if we add u and gamma, we get a superharmonic function, and u is non negative. So that function is greater than or equal to s, because s is just the pointwise and femum of all such functions. Okay. So that's one inequality. Okay, and the other one is just uh, one line application of the maximum principle. So you take s minus gamma minus u. So this is superharmonic on a plus b, because on a plus b, we actually have an equality here. So why is it not just harmonic? Yeah, I guess it's, it is harmonic on it, but we only use the super direction. Um, and it's non-negative outside, because <coughs> s is greater than gamma, and u is 0 outside a plus b. Okay? And so by the maximum principle, it's non-negative inside as well. OK, and now we can just define the scaling limit by taking the previous slide and replacing the sums by integrals. And everything translates to the continuum. So we have, so this will be the scaling limit of the diaconus Fulton sum. So you take two bounded open sets in RD, and I'll assume they're not too ugly, so their boundaries have measure 0. So I, I'm going to define their, we call it the smash sum of A and B, to be the union of A and B with the set of points where S is strictly bigger than gamma, where gamma is this obstacle. So this is the Green's function for the continuum. So it's just, you know, in, for D, at least 3, it's proportional to uh, you know, x minus y to the D minus 2, and 2 dimensions proportional to log. 2 minus d, thanks. So Laplace g is the data. Yes. OK, and we take its least superharmonic majorant. That's s. And, and this is our definition of the smash sum. OK, so Jennifer asked, why is it called the obstacle problem? And this is the visual intuition for y. So, so here I've graphed the obstacle for two different initial or two different choices of A and B. So in the top A and B are some overlapping disks in R2. 
And I think the bottom picture is a little easier to understand. So there, there's just two point sources. So what's going on in this picture is that um, for large, so for x far from the origin, this quadratic term is dominating because these are only logarithmic terms. And so you get this overall downward slope. But near your sources x1 and x2, the log spike is dominating. And so you get these two poles. And now we're taking the least superharmonic majorant of these functions. Now what does that mean? So intuitively, you can think of, or think of these as the surfaces of a table. And we're draping a tablecloth over the table. Okay, but it has to be a superharmonic tablecloth. <laughs> so that means that it can't have any local minima. Okay? So if you think about it not having local minima, well, that's not a problem you know, out here where it's kind of uh, already concave. The tablecloth can sit right on top of the surface of the table. But in here, where there's this indentation, the tablecloth will lie strictly above the surface of the table. And that's this region s greater than gamma, which is the smash sum. Uh, it's not exactly flat on. Yes. Right. That's one thing that makes the single source case a lot easier, is that in that case, the obstacle is actually just flat, or the, the majorant is actually just flat. But in general, it's not. Yes, it's harmonic. OK, and this is uh, you know, taking a top-down look at these two pictures. So this is the domain s greater than gamma for two overlapping disks in R2. And just a teaser, so I'm, I'll t come back to this at the end. But So I've given you a kind of not very explicit description of these domains in terms of solving this free boundary problem. But we actually have an explicit description. So the boundary is given by a certain algebraic curve. Right, so this picture was uh, was built using the rotor router model, which I haven't talked about today, but probably a lot of you have heard me or Yuval or Jim Prop or someone talk about it. Um, <laughs> so, so there are actually three models which have the same scaling limit, and those are internal DLA, rotor router, and divisible sand file. So for those who don't know, rotor router is a deterministic analog of random walk, which well, was invented several times. We heard about it from Jim Prop. OK. So let me give a more detailed statement of the main result. So suppose we have some bounded open sets in RD whose boundaries have measure 0. We take some sequence delta n, which will represent the lattice spacing. And then in the lattice delta n z d, we can build domains in three different ways using either the divisible sand file, rotor router, or this diaconus Fulton dynamics. So let's call those domains d n, r n, and i n. Okay. Then they all converge to the same domain D. And this domain D is defined uh, as I've just gone through on previous slides. So it's the union of A and B with this set of points where the tablecloth lies strictly above the table. And this arrow here is in the, so the convergence of domains is in the same sense that uh, I mentioned before. So it's in the sense of these epsilon neighborhoods. Questions about the result? So the set of points where the tablecloth lies above the table, you can say is if you start to end and walk there, in, then you have some stopping rule which would give you a, uh, this value. Um, but the 
everywhere in the world, and you can, like, you can stop it wherever, whenever you like. Mm -hmm. There's some stopping rules, so, so that the expected value will be this value, and it's the maximum such value you can achieve. Yeah, that might be right. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> okay. You should I'll think about that. Thanks. So I think this is this might be rephrasing what you said, but there's a so there's a paper which talks about this smash sum in terms of a certain game. So suppose you play Suppose you play the following game. You have your two sets A and B. You start a Brownian motion somewhere, and you get credit. So for, for the amount of time you spend in the symmetric difference, you get credit 1. And for the amount of time you spend in the intersection, you get credit 2. And for the amount of time you spend outside, you get no credit. And you also pay a penalty for the length of time you walk. So, so then you want to. Uh, the set of points where there is a stopping rule where you have a positive expectation. So that's exactly the smash sum. Okay, so what is this theorem saying? In pictures, it's just saying why these three pictures look so similar. So we formed smash sums with three different models, and we get uh, basically the same thing. Certainly, experimentally, it seems that way, and also theoretically, it's most it's easiest to analyze. So, um, do you have better the bulk, but the, the error is yes. the rate of convergence? Yeah. So we have some pretty sharp bounds in the single source case. So when you get a disk, so all the models will give you a disk in the limit in the single source case. But divisible sand pile, you get much closer than the others. So divisible sand pile, you get a constant error in the radius, independent of the number of particles. For rotor router, we have a, a log inner error, power law outer error. And then for internal DLA, it's power law in both directions, or at least that's the best known. So Are there lower bounds which establish a uh, Not as far as I know. So I think, I think you can prove a log or maybe square root log lower bound for internal DLA. But I don't think that's written up anywhere. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for, I should say for rotor router, there are no lower bounds. So as far as we know, it could be constant. And that's. Okay, I won't have time to say much about the proof, but kind of like this slide because it condenses like around 50 pages into one slide. So, <laughs> so from a very high level, you know, <laughs> what's the outline of the proof? Well, there's sort of three steps. First, we want to show that the obstacles or the tables are converging, and there are just some Green's function estimates you use there. So, the point is you have your Green's functions on the lattice, and you also have the Green's function in the continuum. And those are what you use to build your table. And so some fairly standard Green's function estimates will, will tell you that those are converging. And then the next step is, well, if you have some tables in the lattice that are converging to a table in the continuum, you should expect probably that the tablecloths will also converge. Um, this step takes quite a bit of work, but you know, the idea is you can sort of compare, you know, given superharmonic functions in the continuum, you can build functions in the lattice that are close to superharmonic and vice versa. So you can use that to compare the tablecloth. And then once you know the tablecloths converge, that tells you that the odometer functions converge. And you might think that that should be um, the main 
part that you should be almost done because you know that the domains that you're after are just the supports of the odometer function. But there's this issue of, well, you can certainly have functions that converge where it, while, while their supports don't converge. You, know, you can have positive functions converging to zero. So clearly you need something more than just convergence of the odometer functions to get this final convergence of the domains. And that turns out to be technically rather tricky. So. Yeah, so that's one of the main technical tools is you this comes from PDE, uh, where you can show that for these obstacle problems, uh, if you take a point on the boundary, there's always a direction you can move in so that your function grows at least quadratically in that direction. And that's, so in PDE, there's a big industry of, of boundary regularity for the obstacle problem. Um, and that's, those are the kind of techniques they use there. <laughs> so who are the, the PDE people who work in this? So the big name is Caffarelli, Louis okay. Caffarelli. Yeah. Um, we, we talked a lot with Craig Evans at Berkeley. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Craig yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I somehow doubt that Louis would be like <laughs> So I want to come back to the original question, which was multiple point sources. So, so here's a, a version of our result for multiple point sources. So you start with your k points in RD and your k intensities. And once again, you can build domains in the lattice in three different ways using the three different types of dynamics. And you do it in such a way, so you you scale it. So you, this is in the lattice delta NZD. And you choose the appropriate number of points per site, so proportional to delta N to the minus D. And then there will be a limiting domain D. And we can say what this domain is. So it's just a smash sum of balls. So you take for each source xi, you take the ball of volume lambda i centered at that source. Take the smash sum of those balls, and that will be the limiting domain. And the way we prove this is, well, we combine the single point source case, which for internal DLA, this is the law of Branson Griffith. And for the other two models, this is earlier joint work with Yuval. And so we combine that with the result about the diaconus Fulton sum. So I, I want to just briefly mention a, an intriguing connection that we discovered recently with a topic called quadrature domains. So these are studied in, uh, in fluid mechanics and in <laughs> potential theory. So, and this is ultimately how we understand the algebraic curve defining the boundary. So suppose you have a harmonic function on the lattice. You can use this to define a martingale for internal DLA. So Internal DLA, we have a bunch of random walks. So let's call those walks uh, x superscript j. And then let's let mt, so t is time, be the sum of our harmonic function at the locations of the walks. Okay. So what happens if you use optional stopping on this martingale? Well, so I'm going to use it at the stopping time t when all my walks have uh, found unoccupied sites. And once they've done that, this, so they form some, um, some occupied set I sub n. So expected value of mt is just the expected value of this sum of the harmonic function over the set. And so note this sum is still random because I n is a random set. Okay. Optional stopping says that's equal to the starting value of our martingale. So we're using multiple point sources. So the starting value will just be, well, at each source xi, I started this many 
particles. Okay, now what is this saying? Well, we know <coughs> that these domains I n are converging to some domain d in the continuum. So this is saying we should expect the following to be true. If we take a harmonic function and integrate it over d, we should just get a weighted sum of the values of the function at the points xi. Yeah, the, the lambda i's are the intensities of the sources. Okay, now how should you think about this identity here? So this, this type of identity, which holds for all harmonic functions on a certain domain, is called the quadrature identity. And it generalizes the mean value property of harmonic functions. So mean value property is the case k equals 1. Take k equals 1, you're saying, D, sat D has the property that if I integrate a harmonic function over it, I get a constant times its value at a single point. So what domain has that property? A ball. So this is saying internal DLA for multiple sources should have the same property, only instead of evaluating at one point, we need to sum over evaluations at k different points. I jumped ahead. So let me just throw out a question to the audience. So suppose you have a domain D, which you know satisfies this identity for all harmonic functions on D. Does that uniquely determine D? So you're given lambda i and xi. Right, you're given lambda i and xi. Anyone want to guess whether this uniquely determines D? I guess it's yes because I would try to reduce it to the case of the ball. Okay. So let's think about the case of the ball. So um, it turns out it's not quite enough to uniquely determine D. For example, a ball and an annulus are in two dimensions. A disk and an annulus both have this property. Mm. But it's not far from uniquely determining D. So what does uniquely determine it is if you require inequality for all superharmonic functions. So Why this would a disk in the annulus uh, be okay? mass kind of averages in the middle of the So, I mean, harmonic functions have mean value property on, on a sphere, right? So any, any spherically symmetric. Right, but the function doesn't have to be even defined as the center of it if your domain is in the annulus. Aha, I see. Okay, so maybe if if you say your function need only be defined on D, it's possible it uniquely determines it. That's a good point. So, so I'm not sure about that. So relation between the So So suppose you have a domain D which satisfies this inequality for all superharmonic functions. So this uh, is called the quadrature domain. These were originally defined in 76 by Aharonov and Shapiro, and then studied since then by many authors, um, Gustafsson, Sakai, and many others. Um, and a lot is known about these domains. So, so in particular, we can prove that the smash sum of balls is a quadrature domain. 
And remember, we're interested in this. I mean, how does it help us to require this for superharmonic functions? Yeah. up to measure zero. So remember this smash sum of balls was the scaling limit for internal DLA with multiple sources. So that was sort of the answer to our original question. And we found that actually it's a quadrature domain. And in particular, one thing that's known about quadrature domains is their boundaries are given by algebraic curves. So, so the boundary of this smash sum of k balls lies on an algebraic curve of degree 2k. So, so here's this picture again for the two sources. So, so this domain satisfies this quadrature identity. So if h is any harmonic function on the domain, then if we integrate h over area measure, we get just um, the sum of h at minus 1, 0 and at 1, 0. And this is the shape whose boundary is given by that algebraic curve of order 4 that appeared on an earlier slide. Okay, I'm so, so how much time do I have? Yeah, ten, 10 minutes is fine. So. So I want to talk briefly about some inverse problems. So we have this smash sum operation. Let's see you know, what we can understand about it. So suppose we're given a domain A and a subset B of A. So can we subtract? So can we find a domain C such that A is B plus C? Well, in a sense, this is a boring question because there's a trivial solution, just the set theoretic difference of A and B. Right. You take the smash sum of those. You know, there's no overlap, no, no mass moves boring. Okay. But you might ask, is there a simply connected solution? Another question, can we take half of a domain? So given a domain A, can we find a domain D such that A is equal to D plus D? Here it's not clear. There's no trivial solution you can just pull out. So it's not even clear one exists. So I want to talk about some work in progress, which is an, an algorithm I have, which in some cases can So if A happens to be a ball, you can take a smaller ball. But what if A is a square? You know. So. Okay. So so here's an algorithm which will compute these domains, at least in some cases. So. So I'm going to run this in the lattice because I actually want to compute something. So I say that sites on the boundary of A start eroded and sites in the interior start uneroded. Okay, and at each time step, I start with mass one on each site in B, mass zero everywhere else. At each time step, I scan the whole grid, and each uneroded site will distribute its mass equally to its neighbors, except that you're never allowed to have an eroded site with mass more than one. Now, 
sites can become eroded. So if an eroded site fills up and attains mass 1, then all of its neighbors become eroded. So I claim that when you finish this process, so finished means all the mass got distributed to eroded sites, so nothing else moved, you'll have, well, you'll have left some set of uneroded sites, which solves this subtraction problem. Okay, so you okay, so you distribute as much mass from X as possible, but one of its neighbors, if it has an eroded neighbor, and that eroded neighbor fills up, then you stop distributing mass from X. And you stop distributing the other yes, you're never allowed to distribute unequally. So if you can't distribute to one neighbor, you can't distribute to any. Okay, so here I've taken A to be a square and B to be a disk. So this set of black sites remaining is the square minus the disk. Okay, and you can use the same algorithm to find half of a domain and there your starting configuration is just mass one half at every site in A. Okay, now why does this work? Well, there's a little more to be checked, but essentially the main idea is just compare odometers. So if in your erosion, if m of x is the amount of mass that ends up at x, then if we take the odometer of the erosion process, counting how much mass was emitted from each site, then your final and initial mass masses are related by adding Laplacian of the odometer. Okay, on the other hand, our final mass distribution is just, while well, we take all our sites, uh, we take, it's concentrated on the eroded sites. So it's 1A minus 1D, where D is the uneroded sites. So if you just equate these two, you get that indicator of A is twice indicator of D plus 2 delta U. So this is saying we start with mass 2 on D and we topple it according to this odometer, then we'll end up with mass 1 on A. So it's saying exactly that if I double D I get A. Yeah. Right. That's right. So there's no unique solution. This will find a solution. Yeah, so in some instances, I think there's a minimal solution in a certain sense. But this is something I'm still working on. So, so here's the computation of half of a square. So this, I don't want to give uh, too rosy a picture of this, so there are some interesting difficulties here. So here's what happens when I run the algorithm on a square that's twice as big. So this is 200 by 200 square. It looks like it's working fine, but You get some crazy result. And what's going on is that it's extremely sensitive to rounding errors. So this erosion. Um, this one looks erosive. <laughs> 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 so it's got some, some kind of instability. It's very unstable, yeah. So Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm thinking about that. So. Yeah, I agree. But I wonder if you could do somehow an integrated version of this instead of one <coughs> something that's more like the differential equation. Mm -hmm. And whether that would be more stable, I don't know. Yeah, I'd be interested if you have any ideas because I'm I played with various variants of it, and they're better and worse, but none of them are particularly good so far. So I agree some kind of smoothing is the right technique. But. OK, finally, I just want to briefly mention some. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is you want to get rid of roughness on the boundary. So you should erode things to the boundary and then smooth a little bit. Right. So I just want to go back to uh, internal DLA, but talk about the erosion analog of it. So. And here there are a lot of interesting open questions. Yeah, I think so. If you have ideas, we should discuss it. So consider the following model now. We start with some finite set in ZD. And now, instead of aggregating, adding points on the outside, we're going to take away points from the boundary. So we start random walks at the origin. We run them until they reach a point adjacent to the complement. And then we remove that point from the region. Okay, and we iterate that process until we remove the origin itself from the region. So this is some random set, which I'll call the internal erosion of A. So here's the internal erosion of a square. My random walks are starting in the center. They walk until they reach a white site, or I'm sorry, until they reach a site adjacent to a white site, and then they turn that site white. Yeah. So Okay, here's the same thing with the disk square again. Okay. And some questions you might ask, maybe the basic question is just how many sites get eroded? So we would expect, say you start with a square of side length n, that this expected number of eroded sites should, should obey some power law with an exponent strictly between 1 and 2. And the analogy here, as Jennifer pointed out, is with uh, DLA. So DLA is maybe the most, the oldest and most famous of these models, where you start with your walks at infinity or very far from the origin, and you grow a cluster that way. So here we're sort of exchanging the role of the origin and infinity. So, um, and another question you can ask is, you know, fix a particular site, what's its chance of being eroded? So.
So I think one would need to do some work to rigorously prove the equivalence with DLA, but. But probably it's worth proving something about one or the other before proving the equivalence. So it's not so useful to have two very hard models that are equivalent if you can't analyze either one. So here's Here's just a Monte Carlo, which is estimating the chance of a given site being eroded. So the, the light blue squares are more likely to be eroded. Uh, you stop when the origin gets eroded. Yeah. So these white squares were never eroded, even though we've already run this you know, 50 or maybe even 100 times. So if you run this picture for longer, it looks like like this. So this was run for 7,000 times, and still there's these substantial regions which weren't eroded. It seems clear that there's these very unlikely sites. It'd be nice to prove something about that. OK, I, I'll skip. This is cute, but I guess I don't have time for it. You can think about it and maybe ask me if you're curious. What happens with internal erosion in one dimension? So you just start with an interval from minus n to n. And <laughs> and you you erode until the origin itself is gone, and the question is how many uh, sites remain uneroded. So this this has been studied under the name OK Corral process, where it's treated as a model of a gunfight. So, so I'll I don't want to reveal the answer because I want to let you think about it, but it's on the next slide. So let me try to skip it really quickly. There, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just end with these two pictures. And these are some scaling limits that we don't understand yet, uh, even though we believe they exist. So this picture on the left is internal DLA with a single point source at the origin is around here. And the condition is the random walks behave as normal, except on the positive x-axis, uh, the walks are killed. So you run until either you reach an unoccupied site, or you reach the positive x-axis, in which case you just kill your walk and start over at the origin. Okay. This was uh, built with a similar rule, but now instead of killing your walk when it hits the axis, you continue walking, but you always step downward from the sites on the axis. On the positive, positive x-axis, yes. So you know your walks can maybe pointer is breaking, but your walks can you know they start at the origin and they might go up, but if they hit the axis, they get forced downward, and then they can't get back up without going all the way around, which is why you get this this kind of distortion. So from experiments, we believe there is a limiting shape in both of these cases, but we don't know what the shape is. Okay, thanks very much. So actually, we th so we I now think it's not a cardioid. It's quite close to a cardioid, but uh, I've been working with Pavel Eddingoff at MIT, who's uh, an expert on Heller-Shaw flow, which is sort of the PDE analog of these questions. And uh, so he has a, a curve which he conjectures this is equal to, which is it's not algebraic, but it's quite a good match to simulations, even better than the cardioid. Yes. The unaided eye. Yeah. <laughs> On the left. Uh, no. It's a good yeah. idea. So, 
Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good point. So we have these three models which have the same scaling limit. So you might ask, you know, if you're interested in you know, computing something quickly numerically which will give a good approximation, which model is the best? And we think seemingly the rotor router is the best because it gives a very small discrepancy, but it's also faster than divisible sand file. Divisible sand file you need to run for a long time because there's always a little bit of extra mass that's still moving around. So, so yes. You mean the, the methods about the growth rate as you move away from the boundary? Probably yes, but I don't know exactly how I'd formulate it. So. Yeah. 